can someone say perfect sequel? Because I thought Spyro 2 Gateway to Glimmer was just that. At least I did back when I was 11. I couldn't get enough of the game. It provided satisfaction for completionists and had the perfect difficulty level as it's not that hard. But as we get older, we realise that Spyro 2 is even easier than the first game. Last time we found a Spyro game too easy, we clipped his wings and I think it's time to do it again. So, can you beat Spyro 2 without gliding? Let's find out. Let's set some rules, but before we do, these videos take a fairly long time to make, so if you would be a gem and subscribe, follow our Twitch channel, and maybe even join our Discord server, you won't regret it. Back to the rules. Rule number one, we cannot glide at any point. We're going to take this a step further and avoid using Spyro's wings completely. Rule number two, any glitches are fair game, but no hacking allowed, of course. And rule number three, once we beat Ripto, the final boss, we win. The only exception to the first rule would be when Spyro enters or exits portals since he glides automatically and we can't control that. Also, we will be aiming for the maximum possible completion percentage as we go, just to see how much of the game we can do within these rules. This means collecting as many talismans, gems and orbs as possible. There are 14 talismans and you earn them by getting to the end of the first 14 levels. There are 64 orbs in total and they are earned by beating side missions as we go. And finally, there is a total of 10,000 gems scattered everywhere throughout the entire game. We start off in Glimmer, which is a simple level. However, I will mention this now. There are three abilities that you must unlock gradually by spending gems. These include climbing ladders, underwater swimming, and the head bash. This would mean that revisiting certain levels later is needed. You can unlock all the abilities straight away by pressing circle, 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 square on the pause menu, but for this challenge, Challenge, we won't be doing that. It's only the first level and already we're expected to use the flight power-up to light all the gem lamps. We can get around this with a trick that we will be using a lot, the double jump. It's not a traditional double jump, but it's a method of gaining more height from a jump than was ever intended. All we need to do is hold the charge button as we're jumping directly upward. If we time it right as we are rising, we can charge upwards and forwards. This allows for some extra height, and this can be performed pretty much anywhere in the game, even on the surface of water. The double jump is exactly what we need to do to light these lamps without flying. We just need to position ourselves right in front of the lamp, jump straight up, hit circle to breathe fire, and then hit square right after to double jump. If done correctly, we should aim our flame upwards as we charge. Doing this for each lamp takes some practice, especially for the set of lamps inside the mine, as these ones are on a time limit, but it's still very doable. We can reach all the high platforms inside the mine with a double jump, so we don't need to climb the ladder. From here, we just need to be quick in getting from one lamp to the next. It took me a few tries, but if I can do it, so can you. There is also a whirlwind on this level, and if used, Spyro will glide out of the whirlwind automatically. Even if we hold square to charge out of the whirlwind, Spyro still glides for a single frame. So we will be banning the use of whirlwinds in this run. The double jump is enough to get around this whirlwind, and with that we can beat Glimmer 100%. We are now in our first homeworld of three, Summer Forest, and here we find a gliding tutorial. We're able to clear some of these gaps with big charge jumps, but we can't clear them all. There are also two window ledges in this homeworld, and it's intended to glide from one to the other. So we can't collect all the orbs here, not without glitches anyway. If we want to reach these orbs, we need to perform the Swim in Air glitch. First of all, we need to pay some of our gems to learn how to swim. This glitch requires a pool of water, and there is a perfect pool right at the start of the world. There are various methods of achieving swim in air, but this may be the easiest one to perform. Just land on the water's surface and swim against this low part of the ground, and then dive. If the positioning is right, we will dive into the ground, but the game thinks we dove under the water. As a result, we can now swim in the air. Using this, we can reach the high up spot to get an orb from Hunter, and we can swim through the window for another orb. The next level is Idle Springs, and the only challenge here comes from the last few gems on high up platforms. You'd normally need to glide from ledge to ledge to reach them all, as some of these platforms are fairly far apart, 
However, there is a room early in the level that we can swim to that contains a puzzle, and near the puzzle is a closed box. We can use this box to perform a proxy. A proxy is the result of Spyro occupying the same space as an object or an enemy. If this were to ever somehow happen, the game is programmed to quickly push Spyro out of this space to prevent him from getting stuck. For example, this closed box does not allow Spyro to stand on top of it. He just falls right off it if we try. However, if Spyro is charging, a proxy won't occur during the charge. This is because Spyro needs to be able to charge through the smaller enemies to defeat them. So this means that we can charge on top of the box without it pushing us off. We can use this to our advantage. If we start by charging on top of the box, but then stop charging as soon as we land on the center of the lid, a proxy will occur and Spyro will be pushed off. However, if we jump straight up as soon as the proxy occurs, the proxy will push Spyro upwards instead, combining the upwards jump and the upward momentum from the proxy and we can gain a good amount of height. It just so happens there is a small window at the top of this building. So if we land the charge jump perfectly and time our normal jump perfectly, we can gain enough height to reach this window. From here we can charge jump to all of the high up platforms that we missed and 100% the idle springs. Now we're in Colossus and almost all high up platforms in this level can be reached by the two spring power ups. There's only one gap in the level you're supposed to glide across, but with a big charge jump on the very edge you can make it over. That makes this level quite easy to 100% complete. Sunny Beach is next, and it doesn't really require too much platforming either. We can get almost everything in this level casually. However, there is a ladder that leads to the last few gems, so we will need to return later. Other than that, the rest of Sunny Beach is quite easy. There is a fair bit of platforming in the later parts of Horror Coast though. To reach some of the gems, we need to glide between these slow-moving propellers to get from ledge to ledge. Fortunately, most of these propellers are close enough to charge jump across. However, there are some at the end that are too far away and we cannot reach them without gliding. The simple solution to this is the double jump. We can use this to reach a high ledge out of bounds and then we can just fall down on the other side, bypassing the last propellers completely. From there we just need to hit some fairly big charge jumps for the last few gems and Horikos is 100% complete. Aquaria Towers is up next and this level hardly needs mentioning as the idea is to fill the level with water by hitting these easy to reach switches. From there, all collectibles can be reached by swimming to them, so that's 100% here too. Now we find our first of four speedway levels, Ocean Speedway. Within these levels, Spyro has the ability to fly, and he will always start off flying as soon as the level starts. Even if we hold square to charge right away, Spyro will still fly for a second or two, so this means that we won't be able to play any of the four speedway levels at all. The reward for each speedway is 400 gems, and there is also one orb per speedway as well. So already this means that 1,600 gems and four orbs are impossible in this challenge. But now that we have all six talismans in the summer forest, we can fight the first boss, Crush. Thankfully this boss does not require any gliding at all, so we can defeat him and go right to the second homeworld, Autumn Plains. First things first, here we can buy the ability to climb ladders. This means we can revisit both Summer Forest and Sunny Beach to finish them both 100%. We need to to use the double jump to reach one of the orbs in the autumn plains which is behind this damaged wall. There is another damage wall that we can break later in the home world, but this reveals a whirlwind that leads to the roof. There are some gems on the roof that we want to get, so we'll need to find another way up there. From near the top of the ladder, we can double jump our way across the rooftops, and we can make our way over to the main part of the roof for a few more gems. These charge jumps required to get from roof to roof here is quite tricky, but with some practice we can just make it. There's another whirlwind up here to get even higher up, but since we can't use this, we're forced to miss out on a few gems, and there's even an orb we have to miss out on, as it's on a small island in the distance that requires gliding to reach. This leaves the Autumn Plains on 62% completion. Now we will move on to the Crystal Glacier, and the only difficult part of this level is killing all of the Draclets. You would normally use the flight power up to fly through the caves and flame them all as quickly as you can. Of course, we're stuck on the ground for this, and whereas it is still possible to kill most of them, some of them are hanging from webs in the tunnel of deadly liquid. Not to mention if you don't kill them fast enough, they increase their numbers again by multiplying. It's safe to say we cannot pull this off without flying, so we'll have to move on. My favourite level is next. 
next, Skelos Badlands. This isn't a very platform heavy level, the only challenging gaps here at the very end, but they can all be cleared with charge jumps. Even this lizard over lava can be hit with a big charge jump. There is a gem on a tiny ledge surrounded by lava, but it's not too difficult, and this means we can 100% the Badlands. Would you believe the hardest part of Breeze Harbour is the very start? Right away we must power up a machine to activate a whirlwind, and it's intended that we use the whirlwind to continue the level, so we're going to need a different way up. If we look at the machine itself, we can see a pipe sticking out the side. We need to use a double jump to land on the pipe. The surface of the pipe isn't very level, which makes this double jump fairly tricky, but once we put it off, we can use another double jump to reach the high platform. From here, the rest of the level is played casually. You can even double jump on top of the track here, and then from there you can pretty much travel to anywhere in the level you want. So we can 100% Breeze Harbour. Just make sure not to approach the trolley cart from this side because Spyro tries to talk to the NPC close by and he just gets stuck here forever. Zephyr is next and it's very much a level of two halves. There's an upper half that can be beaten with no problem, but then there's a lower half. Once you've fallen down here, the only way back up is to ride a whirlwind, so we need to make sure we've finished everything up top first. Once we're at the bottom, there are a few wide gaps, but they can all be cleared with big charge jumps. There are two issues we face down here though. The first is reaching Juliet. We're supposed to use these seeds to grow some beanstalks and then platform our way over to her. We can make it about halfway before the gaps become too wide. Our second problem is this question mark jar. As soon as we break it, the jar teleports to another part of the level, and you need to keep finding it and breaking it for some more gems. The first time we find the jar, it's at the lower half of the level. After we break it the first time, it teleports to the upper part of the level. And as we mentioned, the only way back up there is a whirlwind. There is a solution to our first problem though. Before we fall down, we can double jump on this wall and leap over to the other side of the map to end up right where we find Juliet. As for our second problem, we'll come back to that later. For now, we will go to the next level, Scorch. And this is one of the easier levels, as we simply don't need to glide at all. There is one whirlwind that leads to a lot of gems, but we can use a double jump to reach this ledge right from the start. That's Scorch 100% beaten. The Fracture Hills is a similar deal. All the gems can be reached just fine. The only thing we can't do here is take out these giants until we learn Head Bash. So we'll just have to return turn here later. For now, we head to the Magma Cone. The beginning of this level is simple, as we can get around mostly using ladders. There is one high up ladder that leads to a mini game with Hunter, but we can use a double jump to reach that one. The biggest challenge of this level is at the end. We're tasked with defeating all these lava monsters surrounding a volcano. We're supposed to use a flight power up, and then we're supposed to use the rocks being spewed out of the lava to defeat each one. There's no time limit, so we can try to get all of them without the flight power. There's a rock at the bottom that we can just reach without landing in the lava, and we can fire the rock at the monsters from the top of the volcano, but this means that we have to tediously climb the volcano for each monster. After we've taken out the 10 that we can see around the volcano, there are two more inside a lava tunnel. If we do a big charge jump from the top of the volcano, we can just reach a platform where we can see the 11th monster. We have to use first person to aim the rock just right, and then we have to quickly jump after spinning out the rock to make sure we could see the monster just before it got hit. This allows the game to register the hit. The twelfth and last monster is just within the other side of the tunnel, but it's quite a ways inside, so it will be difficult to get without flying. We climb our way back on top of the bridge, and we can see the tunnel entrance below. From here we charge jump down to the tunnel and quickly spit the rock at the monster. We have to make sure we spit the rock before landing in the lava, as you can't spit during the damage animation. As soon as we hit the monster, we start taking damage from the lava. If we take 4 hits, we will die, and then we'll have to kill all 12 monsters all over again. But, when we complete a mission in this game, we are warped back to the NPC that gave us the mission so we can receive our reward. This happened to us just in time, as it was right after the third hit from the lava. That's 100% for Magma Cone. That brings us to the Shady Oasis. There's a bit of platforming on this level, but it can be done with the charge jumps. You're supposed to hit each of the magic 
berry bushes each time you find one, and every time we find a new one, the game puts it a little bit more out of our reach. But it's nothing that charge jumps and rock spitting can't handle. There are a few feeds we need to chase down on this level, but that doesn't require gliding. We just need to revisit this level when we get the head bash ability for the last orb and the last few gems. Now we have all 14 talismans, so we can challenge Gulp, the second boss of the game. This boss also does not require any gliding whatsoever. So once again, we beat the boss casually and move on to the third and final homeworld, Winter Tundra. Right away, we can purchase the head bash ability here, so we will revisit a couple of the previous levels before we move on. We can now finish the last mission in Fracture Hills to 100% that level, and we can revisit Shady Oasis to break open the head bash crate and finish the last mission here for another 100%. As for Winter Tundra, this is the smallest homeworld by far. We can prevent using the whirlwind here by climbing the stairs and then jumping down on the wall to reach the orb. The first level in Winter Tundra is the Mystic Marsh. This level starts off easy with no real platforming. We can even use the spring power up to get to the high up platforms and treetops. But the difficulties come at the end. We need to chase down these fees to retrieve some spark plugs. A couple of them are quite tricky without gliding, as they jump up high and across wide gaps. They can even use the spring power up themselves. But once you know their paths, they're not too bad. This leaves a single balloon hanging in the air. Normally, we'd use the spring power up and then glide to the balloon so we can flame it down, but we need an alternative method. Back in Glimmer, we were able to shoot our flame upwards to hit the gem lamps by flaming right before a double jump, and we can do that again here to just hit the balloon. We're only just able to reach it this way. That's 100% for Mystic Marsh. Next, we have Cloud Temples, and this level was a challenge. Right near the start, we're meant to use a whirlwind to get to the upper floor of these buildings, and we're not going to finish this level unless we get up there. In order to get around this, we have to perform a super awkward double jump at an odd angle, but with some practice, we were able to get it. Shortly after that, we come to a large gap that seems impossible to clear without gliding. Once again, if we can't clear this gap, we can't get to the end of the level, but we have a workaround. The main aim of this level is to defeat the warlocks and allow the inhabitants to recover their magic wands. As soon as they do recover the magic wand, they use it to clear the way for Spyro so we can continue the level. We can see a warlock on the other side of this large gap, but we can't reach it from here. However, some of the enemies we defeated earlier drop rocks that we can spit. If we can spit one of these rocks all the way over the gap to take out this warlock, this activates the cutscene where the wand is recovered, and this cutscene also just so happens to teleport Spyro over the gap. From here, we can reach the end of the level for an orb, but there's still two more orbs on this level. One of them requires us to follow the secret agent without him seeing us, but he makes a huge jump over this gap. Despite my numerous tries, we could just not clear this gap. For the next orb, we need to ring three bells. We can use the ice power up to reach two of them, but the third bell is way up on the roof, and the only way up there is with a whirlwind, so we'll have to skip that orb too. Instead, we'll head over to Robotica Farms. There isn't really a lot of platforming in this level. The double jump can be used to reach any high up ledges, and the orbs here are all earned with speed over anything else, so that's another level 100% cleared. So we'll head to Metropolis next. Early on there's a fairly big gap that we need to clear to reach this ladder, and you can't charge jump into a ladder if you want to grab onto it. You either need to glide into it or do a regular jump. Thankfully, it's just possible to reach this ladder with a regular jump. There are a few elevators in this level that help us to reach some of the higher platforms, but right at the end of the level there's a mission that requires a flight power up. We're supposed to use the flight power up to take down flying saucers above us, and the flight can also be used to reach some of the gems on the high up ledges. Our charge jumps and double jumps can only get us so far here and we simply cannot reach the last few gems without flying. Not normally anyway. Remember that ladder from earlier? It leads to a different mission where you blow up a bull whilst on ice. But you can actually double jump onto the wall either side of the ice rink. From here, we're fairly close to the other side of the high up ledges that we couldn't reach before. But without gliding into a head bash, the ledge is still just out of reach. So it's time to try something else. From this wall, it's actually possible to jump and land under the ice from out of bounds. There's nothing really under here, and it doesn't lead anywhere, so this seems pointless. But check this out. If we double jump, it's possible to clip back on 
top of the ice. But if we time our double jump just right, we can get Spyro halfway above and below the ice. If we're just high enough that the game tries to push us back up above the ice, then a proxy can occur. Remember the proxy jump we did back in Idle Springs? This is essentially the same thing. We need to be charging off the double jump to reach the ice, but then quickly stop charging right as Spyro gets stuck between the ice. The game tries to push Spyro up and out of the ice, and this can cause Spyro to gain unnatural height. The timing and positioning need to be just right, but if we get that right, we can get flung onto the grassy ledge that we couldn't reach before. From there, we can walk back in bounds through the invisible wall, since it's only solid on one side, and then grab the treasure we couldn't reach before. However, there is still a head bash crate on an even higher platform in the center of this room, and we simply can't get up there to break it open. So we couldn't quite get 100% here. Now we will challenge the final boss of the game, Ripto. There are three phases to this battle, and just like with both Crush and Gulp, the first two phases don't require our wings whatsoever. And then the third phase hits and the floor is completely destroyed, leaving nothing but lava and forcing a flight power up on us. We came all this way to have the final phase of the final boss itself be impossible. So unless someone can figure out how to skip this entire phase, I don't see how it'll ever be possible to beat Ripto without flying. But let's not let the challenge end there. We still need to 100% complete as many levels as we can, and there's still more we can do. Normally, once we beat Ripto, we unlock the bonus level Dragon Shores. There aren't any gems or orbs in Dragon Shores, but there is something there that we really want. The first step is getting into Dragon Shores itself. Its portal is only in place after Ripto is defeated, but defeating Ripto doesn't spawn the portal like you might think. It simply moves the portal upwards, as the portal starts under the map on the same spot. So if we can get out of bounds in the Winter Tundra, and under the map on this spot, we can warp into Dragon Shores without fighting Ripto. Normally speedrunners would get over the cliff edge and glide down to just underneath the shallow water, and that would allow Spyro to swim in the air. But since we can't glide, we need another way. That's when I learned it was possible to jump and charge into the very edge of this small waterfall, and with the perfect position and timing, Spyro would swim in the air. The only evidence I had that this was even possible was a 10-year-old YouTube video by Crash41596, so it had to be possible. Sadly though, despite hours of attempts, I just could not replicate this method of swimming air. Those who have been in the Spyro 2 speedrun community for a long time seem to recall this being done in a run once or twice, but with how ridiculously precise it is, it was never considered to be a viable strategy, and people simply moved on. But in the interest of seeing how much we can actually accomplish, even theoretically, let's see what else we can do from here. As soon as we're able to get the swim in air, we can swim directly underneath where the Dragon Shore portal would normally be, and we can hit the portal from out of bounds. Right at the start of Dragon Shores, we need 8,000 gems and 55 orbs. But fortunately, we already have enough gems and orbs by now. There is a way to skip past this door if you didn't have enough gems or orbs, but it's very difficult to do without gliding. Inside the Dragon Shores, there are several mini games, but we're only interested in one of them the roller coaster. And here's why the main reason we came to Dragon Shores in the first place was to get a power up that's locked behind a door. This door won't open until we have collected all 10,000 gems and all 64 orbs in the game. Of course, we haven't done that yet, so we need another way in, and this is why we're interested in the roller coaster. If we talk to the guy that lets Spyro on the roller coaster, we start start riding it immediately. However, in the half a second we get before Spyro starts to ride, we have control of Spyro. In this moment, we can quickly turn and jump charge away. It took a bit of practice, but if we get the timing right, we can carry the momentum after we appear on the roller coaster. This allows us to jump right off the cart and onto the track. Now we're free to follow the track as far as the double jumps can reach. From the highest point, we are above the entrance, and there is a pool of water below us, and the pool of water is mostly out of bounds. From here we can land in the pool. The idea is to use the water to submerge, and because the water is out of bounds, we would be able to swim in air. However, as soon as we try to dive, the game crashes. 
every single time. It turns out, due to the game never intending us to be able to submerge in the Dragon Shores, the game completely fails to be able to animate it. As it happens though, it's not Spyro's underwater animation that's the issue, it's Sparks. As long as our Dragonfly friend is with us, the game will crash every time we dive in Dragon Shores. So to get rid of Sparks, we simply need to take damage three times before coming to the Dragon Shores. Once we've done that, we repeat the process to get back to that pool of water and now we can dive. The only annoying part now is that the camera isn't quite prepared for Spyro to be able to submerge here, so it struggles to follow us around, but regardless we can now swim under the map and up into the locked room with the power up that we want. This power up is a powerful fireball attack and it's permanent. Now we can quit the level from the pause menu and return to some previous levels that we haven't fully beaten yet. The hope is that our new fireball power will allow us to 100% a few more levels. Firstly, there was the Draculets mission in the Crystal Glacier. We can't fly through the tunnel to kill them, but the fireball has very good range. We can use first person view to aim precisely, and if we're quick, we can run and gun from one side of the tunnel all the way around to the other side and kill all the Draculets in time. That's 100% in Crystal Glacier. Remember that question mark jar in Zephyr? Well now, if we use a double jump to get out of bounds, we can travel across the wall until we're above the jar. And now, from here, we can break it with the fireball. Since we never jumped down to the bottom, we can break the jar in every place it appears now and claim the last few gems in Zephyr. That's 100% here too. We return to Cloud Temple, and before, we had to give up on ringing that third bell on the roof, but we're gonna try and shoot it from the floor below. We stand on the very edge and turn towards the opening on the roof, and using first person view, we can aim upwards to the bell. But unfortunately, this is the highest we can aim and it's just not high enough. But we found another way. If we back Spyro against a wall and then use first person view, the camera gets stuck against the wall. From here we can make Spyro look up further than intended. So we want to try to use this to hit the bell. The only thing we can use to get the camera stuck is one of these short spires that normally give us the power ups when we walk between them. With the camera stuck juddering from either side of the spire we can aim high and we just spam the fireball. It took a little while but finally we managed to shoot a fireball bang on target and ring the bell. That's one more orb in Cloud Temple. Now we head back to Metropolis and if you remember last time we were here we couldn't reach the head bash crate but if we use the ice proxy again to get back to the roof we can destroy the crate from a distance with the fireball. Several gems scatter out but they're all stuck on that platform. However if we climb all the way to the roof of the dome we are now directly above this platform. It looks like we can just charge through the gaps up here, but there's actually an invisible barrier. This barrier is supposed to prevent us from flying out of the map, but all it does if we fall through it from this side is stagger Spyro as he goes through. This is what's preventing us from charge jumping through the gap, so instead we have to fall through the gap from the top. We can just fall close enough to the platform that Sparks grabs one of the gems on the way down. This means we have to make our way back up to the roof using the ice proxy every single time we want to try and grab another gem like this. We must make sure to choose where we fall carefully so that we are as close to each gem as possible. This is a very tedious process but eventually Sparks can grab every single one of these gems. That is 100% for Metropolis. After all that we have collected all 14 talismans, over 8,200 gems out of 10,000 and 58 orbs out of 64. Excluding the four speedways the only levels we can't beat 100% are the Autumn Plains homeworld and Cloud Temple. There is a trick that can be done on the Autumn Plain homeworld that is theoretically possible, but as far as I'm aware, it's never been done by a human player. It's called the Double Frog Proxy, and it's basically using a proxy to gain both height and distance, and it's done using two of these frogs. This footage is from a tool-assisted speedrun where all the button inputs are pre-programmed, but it shows that it's possible to kill the first frog with a fireball and then charge into the second frog right after. Both frogs land and die quite close to each other, and if Spyro stops charging inside the frogs as they die, a double proxy can occur. The momentum from this can be enough to launch Spyro all the way to the distant platform that we would normally have to glide to. Here we can get one more orb and 75 more gems. Like I said though, I've never seen a human player pull this off, but this means it is theoretically possible to collect over 8,300 gems and 59 
orbs without gliding or flying once. If anyone can get more than this, then please let me know because I would love to see it. And if anyone thinks they can get that glideless swim in air in Winter Tundra, then please show me. I need to know how to do it and I have to do it for myself. We may not have been able to figure out how to beat the game itself without flying, but it was a lot of fun figuring out how to obtain as many collectibles as possible. I need to thank the Spyro speedrun community for all their help and thank you all very much for watching. Please subscribe if you enjoyed this video because I plan on making more just like it. You can also follow our Twitch channel if you want to see some of these challenge runs happen live before they end up edited down into these videos. Plus, Twitch subs and patrons will get early access to these videos as well. Speaking of, I want to thank every single one of our Twitch subscribers and patrons. They are Aussie Nuts, Avisu, Bay Blue, Big Wolf Chris, Black Adder, BPD Gamer Girl, Blue Rug One, CD616, Chloe, because that's what she said, CJ Raven07, Collegiate Bison, Cookie560, Cruel Pressure, Dark Blood Scarlet, Davs Brander, DJ Blue, Dino1303, DJ Skill X, Dr. Mantis Toboggan Games, DTG Fin30, Duncan F93, Evolve Pixel, Game Time Official, Gareth1990, Goth Goose, Happy Sam, Have Some Lima, H Bruin, Hollow Goose Gaming, Jamhead91, Joe. P, John Fitz 49, John Von Basslake, Judy Pudi, Kieran 108, Kingsticker, Cotmeister, Lacerated Hunter, Lit Game 83, Lupian Wolf, Mayan Yugdras, Muck Galing, Mr. Griff, Nerd Paladin, Not Muggle Chief 69, Omdal Brumo, P1K, Pruden Gaming, Cyvel, Queen Laura 90, Rabkun, Ray Necky, Seagull King Quinn, Shredern, Skidger, Snipe Backwards, Some Lost Gamer, Spectrum Z90, Star of the Zanuck and Abes, Static Jokes, Stunningly Avg, Swan. Donkey 12, Take Hold, T Bruin, Tempets, The Aussie Noob, The Bloody Screen, The Real Damn The Man, Tim Zero, Toaster Ovens, His Yami Yugo, Yivri, and Z Man Vader, and our patrons Anthony Kermak, A Lazy Dragon, and Jamhead91. You have no idea how much you've helped us. Also, I want to give a shout out to the three that let me use their footage Crash41596, Nuan Tox, and Nitrovsky. The links to their channels will be in the description. So, fun fact, I started recording this video on the Gateway to Glimmer version of Spyro 2 and the reason for this is because I was using original hardware. I had the game on disc but eventually as I was recording it the disc started to fail on me. I guess it was too scratched and I had no choice but to emulate and the best ROM I could find was the Ripto's Rage version and if you watch my Spyro 1 video I made a point to calling it Gateway to Glimmer because that's the version I grew up with and then I ended up having to record the Ripto's Rage version instead so that's karma for you. If you haven't already seen the video that we made for Spyro Spyro 1 without gliding, then it's linked on screen now. Or you could check out the video where we try to beat all the Dark Souls bosses in alphabetical order. Spoiler alert, it was hard.